Um, oh yeah, I remember now. I'm not just the AV guy, for those <laughs> that don't know me. Um, I do a lot of things, lots of different things. And one of those things is um, I like dabbling with data and analytics, um, in particular learning analytics, um, which I hope all of you have that word buzzing in your ears and PVCs are asking you questions like, what should we be doing about learning analytics? In the context of MOOCs, this was a slide I got from um, Simon Buckingsham, who's doing a lot of the future learn, uh, learning analytics. Um, just as Google made their fortune off data and Amazon have made their fortune off data, um, this is where a lot of people see MOOCs making their money off data. So it's not a surprise when uh, Coursera <coughs> announced that uh, you know, they're tying in their their whole platform with um, a career service because they want to use the data that you're generating constantly uh, to come up with something. But there's before I go a bit more into this, it's probably worth just considering what analytics is. Um, this is a, a definition that um, my former colleague Adam Cooper put forward. Um, if you haven't seen it, there's a, a series of uh, briefing papers published by CITES on not just learning analytics, the, 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 the entire spectrum of analytics. And it's, um, it's a very good um, set of publications for you to have a look at. And this is the definition that he, got, he put forward of um, actionable insights. Um, so taking something and producing something that we can do as a, as, as a result of it um, if breaking this down into a very simplistic model, you've got some data, you do some analytic, you get some insight. But um, when you start looking at this one in more detail, insight, who's this insight for? Um, there's various um, actors within, within this, and it was quite nice to see um, uh, Simon Nelson this morning talking about um, the self, the learner. So the learner getting some insight about where, where they should take their own direction of study. Um, also you have the tutor who quite often uh, at the tutor level it might be how do I make this better? How do I make this design better? Where are the things, the points where the, the, the students are struggling? At uh, the institution, the insight might, for them might be uh, uh, who are students that we want to convert onto our courses. Um, and so we have this mix of um, educational uh, commercial drivers as well. To, to get to an insight, you need an analytic. How? Um, the, the top section of that list is um, comes from a paper that uh, Rebecca Ferguson and Simon Fucking Chum wrote on um, five different types of analytic, learning analytic um, for social. Um, so you've got social network al analysis, discourse content, disposition content. Um, one of the reasons I'm quite interested in the field of learning analytics is because it draws in so many different disciplines. There's so many different ways that you might want to analyze data. Uh, and I think it's time to keep reminding ourselves it's not just about learning analytics in this context. Administration, um, that is another aspect of um, analysis that's quite important. And then the data. I was thinking about what data there is and um, within the current climate of uh, Future Learn, Coursera, edX, it's, it's very uh, uh, platform as a service model. Um, so there's data being collected by these platforms. Um, but in the wider context, if you start pulling in um, connectivist style courses, you have service, service data. So data from Twitter, Facebook, uh, the open web. Um, so these can all be sources that, that pull in. And there's, I think, something that's quite often overlooked is um, access and availability of that data, or perhaps it's not being overlooked now. I'm sure quite a few of you now running courses 
are scratching your heads about where's the data, where's the useful data, where's the data I can actually use. And there's different, there's lots of threads of, uh, from data to an analytic to an insight. So what I thought I'd do is um, just show you some existing examples of how uh, analytics has been applied to um, open courses. This first, this is one that really caught my eye, and it was I was quite early in my um, interest in analytics, and I saw this. If it works, hopefully. I said there was no tech. I lied. There's a video. This is Daphne Krula. So here's an example of that from um, Andrew's machine learning class again. This is a distribution of, of wrong answers to one of the programming assignments. The answers happen to be um, pairs of numbers, which is why we can graph them on this two-dimensional plot. Each little x is a different wrong answer. Now you can see that some of the x's are small, representing one-off answers where students just had their own <laughs> particular misunderstanding. But for example, that big X at the top left is where 2,000 students had the exact same wrong answer. Now, if you have two students in a class of 100 that have the exact same wrong answer, you'd never notice. But when you have 2,000 students, it kind of jumps out at you. And so Andrew and his TAs went in and looked at that assignment and understood the misconception that lay at the root of it. And then they constructed a targeted error message so that any other student whose answer fell into that particular bucket would get that targeted error message as opposed to just the, you're wrong. And that gave a much more personalized and useful experience to the students because it put them on the right track um, in terms of what they needed to fix in order to get the right answer. And so this um, effectively is a much more personalized experience that you can do by utilizing this large amount of data that we have. So there you go. The, the, the questions I'd like you to consider are, Where did that data come from? Was it in a raw log? Uh, obviously, Coursera are collecting it, so that's the other thing. They have to be collecting this data so that uh, they can query it. And then someone's got to do that, query it, and come up with a graph. Does, do your platforms that you're using for open courses provide that for you? <laughs> so data access and data shape are all quite important. Yeah. I mean, in order to develop multiple choice questions, you put multiple choices in based on an understanding of the student's perception. Strange, they're doing it the other way around. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do they come up with that multiple choice in the first place? Well, one of the other um, examples of this was they were actually using it for error detection to find the questions that they had posed incorrectly. <laughs> so a tutor had created a question. And he had himself had got the wrong answer. <laughs> and so they're using these techniques to identify bad tutors, bad questions, <laughs> which is another way to look at it. Well, it shows a post. Yeah. It? it shows that there's a disconnect there. Mm. And then you look into the reasons, but by the way, it's jolly enough. And also thinking <laughs> about, th you know, this is a, a very simple XY plot, but. You know, if, if you were wanting to query that data on demographics, was it gender biased, location, um, age, how would you do that with your, with your data? Uh, this is uh, quite a recent one. Uh, I should have probably paid more attention to this when I, before I did the video with Jonathan. It's looking at the length of um, videos in open courses that are most effective, most effective being um, people got to the end of it so they didn't drop out. So in the, the six to nine minute range, so these are groupings of video length. And, uh, I should say this is from edX, this is edX data. Uh, and this is the median time spent uh, watching the video. So in the six to nine minute, you've got a peak of you know, they watched six to minutes of it. So uh, the conclusion is six minutes. Make your videos six minutes, not a minute longer, not a minute less. <laughs> six minutes. Think about the data that's behind this graph. So they've recorded 
student activity in terms of when do they click the play button, when do they stop the play button, and then basically, you know, this is a, a summary of, I think it's about 20,000 um, videos or 20,000 students. Um, so how would you get to this graph? I have answers for these later, you'd be <laughs> pleased to hear. This one's um, uh, quite interesting. This is getting more advanced. Um, this is Coursera data. It's, um, it's quite interesting. This, this analysis is looking at um, engagement and disengagement patterns uh, within Coursera. So we have, they're using the assignments as basically um, an indicator of whether or not a student has is, is still active within the course. And they, they came up with a um, categorization, so A, auditing, so which is, I think we would use terms like lurking, so, you know, you've got legitimate participational, peripheral participation, D, behind, so um, they are still doing the assignments, but out of sequence. Uh, T's on track and O is out. Uh, and this was a, a summary of, I think, about uh, three or six classes. What's also quite interesting about this analysis is it was produced by students. Um, Stanford had the Lytics lab, where uh, some of their students have been given access to Coursera data, and this is what they're coming up with. Some um, interesting analysis, I think. Um, so to come up with these clusterings, they're using um, k-means, which is a, um, a fairly standard uh, analytical tool. And um, one of the reasons that they were interested in this was they wanted to make car comparisons between courses. So was, was there ca characteristics of a particular course that suited another one? So by having a way for them to pull out the data, analyze it, allow them to um, start identifying differences. Uh, but again, you know, they've had to pull out the data, they've had to do some, um, the, you can find the paper online, um, they've had to do several iterations to come up with this point. Uh, and there, there's still work, they say, to be done to, to refine this further. So I, I've kind of been prodding you about this whole data thing, data, 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 which hopefully is the question that you keep asking FutureLearn or Coursera, data, 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 data. But it has to be the right data. So if you're wanting to do analysis of videos, you need that data. So that data needs to be recorded in your system. It's not just about data, it's getting access to it. Um, even within an institution, there can be terrible issues with getting access to the data that you need. So if you're, even if you're using Blackboard, getting the data out there is a nightmare. Um, who, who has permissions to, to give that data? Google Analytics, which I'll come to in a second, is a fantastic tool for getting data and summarizing and analyzing data. but. Usually it's just the web admin that has access to that. How, how's that being distributed through your institution? Um, so we have, you have to get the data, you have to have the data accessible. The other thing is the shape. Um, I, was, I was fortunate to give ac be given access to uh, data from one of the um, MOOC platforms. I can't say which I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> uh, but it was just a big MySQL table dump, you know, a database. So, and talking to people from, is Amy still here? Yeah, is that what you get from Coursera? Just a database dump? And you're kind of left to your own devices to work, work out. I think you can provide data in more useful means. Uh, I quite like CSV. Yeah, yeah. FutureLearn has said it'd be my data uh, as a big 
scary spreadsheet, but also uh, in a nice tidy pink ribbon custom flavored PowerPoint. Good. Uh, for the, for the, um, mm. the um, data literate, I, I, I find that very helpful. Mm. But, but I guess when I probably get better at this, there is some, there are, they're, they're not asking the questions that I would want to ask, and therefore that's you know, it. I, I've got the data yeah. to interrogate. So that's quite helpful, I think. Which, hopefully, if I remember my, my slides, uh, flows, data flows. So it's creating these recipes of, you can get um, a dump of data out of your provider, um, but you're, you're able to quickly turn that into something that's useful to you, that provides the particular insight that you need. Um, and there's a whole list of tools that you can do to do that. But I think within open courses, there's a great opportunity to actually share some expertise around. Um, whether or not the people that have the, the dollar signs in our eyes will permit that. Hopefully they will. So I just wanted to highlight some uh, kind of quick wins, easy alternatives um, that you might not have been aware of but might kind of stimulate some of your thoughts in this area. So here we have again the, the longest video, blah, 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 grant, uh, 20,000 um, students, you know, several weeks work. Uh, this is YouTube. Have you, have you done the, I don't know if you can see this, this is the audience uh, retention graph on a YouTube clip. So this is one of my videos, the snowflake. It was about who we are. Like <laughs> well, no one liked it. You know, we got just above twenty percent of people got to the end. What was that about? <laughs> so this is this is there on YouTube, uh, and YouTube do provide a data export to to a degree, uh, so we can see it nice and we gradually get up. But that that was um, so that this video is uh, it's kind of a a nice fluffy data visualization video. This is a, a different video. This is a instructional video. Look at these peaks. You've got people, and this is <laughs> the nice thing about this. When I play this back, I can see the video. So I can see the point where people are hanging on. So this is an interesting point in terms of cognition, Misconception, maybe. Uh, this video's had, I think, 2,000 views, so you've got quite a decent data set there of what's going on. And there's other things within the YouTube analytics about demographics, location, gender, um, which might help you. How do you tell that when the number of people watching it later are not going to be you can there's a you can you can specify the date range. Oh, so yeah, uh, it's it's not one I've dug deeply into. So I'm saying, if people click on YouTube, for example, you can you can see the thumbnail. Yeah. So you can very quickly yeah. go through and jump. Yeah. How do, how do you have one that you go jumping through a video? If you go to four minutes and then. I don't know, would be the honest answer. Uh, and whether or not that information is public is another question, to, uh, which is another consideration if you were to go down this route. Um, so um, uh, the, the MCQ uh, test, what you can do in Google Analytics is you can actually do event tracking. So, uh, you, with, if you've got a MCQ and you've got Google Analytics, you can track which response people made to that MCQ. You can tag it as correct or wrong. Within Google Analytics itself, you can get a, a summary chart. Um, Google Analytics also allows you to do so we could do which Daphne didn't have. <laughs> uh, 
I could do age, gender. Um, I can run experiments with Google Analytics, A-B testing. So I could be you know, tweaking the, the platform design, running tests and getting data out of Google Analytics. So earlier I mentioned the issue of quite often Google Analytics is held by you know, your web team and they, they don't like giving you admin right or out, admin access. You can get it out as CSV, that's a manual process, but um, there are um, automated ways of doing it as well. Um, basically now Google have a bit of code that lets you proxy the data. So um, you can create a, uh, a segment or an analysis or a slice of data um, and then just make that available on a, on a server. Um, behind uh, authentication, so you can give people access to the raw data in a controlled way. Uh, so the next one, how am I doing on time? <coughs> Three more, okay. So uh, this is uh, Canvas, have you come across Canvas? VLE uh, made in the States. Canvas have Canvas Network, so basically it's a platform to provide open courses. Um, so you can set up, you have the standard kind of um, DLE tools with discussion forms, announcements, uh, assignments. Really nice thing about uh, Canvas is it has an API. API is familiar with everyone? Basically, an API is a way for uh, your, your platform will have lots of data locked away in it, or processes, or functions. And you have something you want to do with that data, processes, functions. And so you write a bit of code that talks to their server, and their server gives it back to you. And it, uh, the Canvas one is very well documented. So we can take a discussion forum within Canvas, and uh, with a bit of a API magic, we get into a spreadsheet. Uh, this was one I did for the the learning analytics open course. Once it's in the spreadsheet, you can just play around with the visualization tools in there. Uh, this is a Google spreadsheet, so I can share it with anyone. So I shared it with the course. So we could compare how we were doing performance-wise. The tutors could see how we were doing performance-wise. Um, having access to an API really helps get the data out so, so that anyone uh, who has access to it can um, slice it up, dice it, do, try and find something interesting or useful. Uh, there's a link up there for more information about that particular one. You can go further, so this is taking it into social network analysis, so we're, we're looking at uh, the individual discussions. And one of the reasons to go into social network analysis is um, that you know, it provides insight into how the group are doing um, particular characters within the group um, so that, they, those were all dealing with other people's platforms. So, um, at Alt, we've actually experimented with our own platform. We ran Octel, um, which was um, an open course that ran early in the year. Uh, not huge numbers, 1,400 students registered. Um, it was in WordPress, so we had full control over the platform, uh, which was a godsend because we could create our own data APIs, get the data out that we wanted, uh, what, which we found useful. So this one, it was a connectivist course, so we wanted to identify um, all the students who had just created a blog and made their first post and hadn't had any comments as a way to target some insight for the tutor team, the target resource to say, hey, go and give this guy some love and affection, go and tell him what he's doing is good, wrong, right. Um, so it's another example of just taking the data out and doing something useful. Um, one of the issues within the open context, a truly open context when you're not platform specific, is that um, people have different profiles online. Um, and there's a danger that they become ana analytically cloaked. But, um, it was quite an eye-opener for me when I came across a site called Full Contact. 
basically you provide a list of email addresses and it goes off and searches those email addresses against various databases and it comes back with a hit rate uh, of I think around, so I've put in 250 email addresses and it's come back to 178 people. It was reasonably kind of, you know, it thought it knew who they were. And it comes back with all this information, which Twitter profile they have, which blog, you know, if they're on clouds, their gender, uh, which is quite scary. So even in, within an open context, you can actually find out quite a lot about someone <laughs> and then use that data uh, for good, for good people. <laughs> um, and we've, we're going on at all to do something with the, the MOOC research initiative to look at some of this open data and analytically clear. Uh, and this was the last slide. So this was from Simon again, uh, this idea of sharing some of these recipes, sharing some of these tools, because the, the field is very broad. And uh, I think we could learn a lot together. Lovely. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.